Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to this weekly webinar produced by Business Performance USA. We are honored to have you here as our guests, and we appreciate your attendance. Just a quick note, uh, Business Performance USA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to growing your business and your career. What we're doing here today and always is to freely share with, uh, with you on our webinars the same intellectual property we use with our clients. We do this because we want to liberate the human potential in the workforce and any organization, which in turn builds prosperity for our communities. So that's why we're sharing this with you, and we welcome you and glad to have you here today. Our webinar today is Problem Solving Series. That's part three, and this webinar is specifically about problem solving being your silver bullet. I am Victor Dominguez, Managing Partner of the Ligature Group, and I will be your host for this hour. Your executive uh, presenter today is Ms. Cynthia Stewart. You can see her there. And Cynthia is the Managing Partner for Evermore Services, your partner in building tomorrow's businesses today. A little bit about Cynthia so you can have some context as to her expertise. Uh, I'm just checking questions here and whatnot, folks. But Cynthia holds her MBA and is certified by the American Society for Quality as a manager of quality and organizational excellence, as well as the Six Sigma Black Belt. So Cynthia really knows her stuff around the quality movement. She partners with leaders in growing high-performance organizations through a strategic and staged approach to employee development, quality improvement, and business problem solving. Hence the topic today, problem solving is your silver bullet. Cynthia successfully led and directed culture change teams at all levels across 11 states during her tenure as Senior Internal Business Improvement Advisor with Central and Southwest and American Electric Power, including strategic merger assignments that created the third largest value generating utility in the United States. That's no small thing. She is credited with having guided thousands of people in hundreds of teams and occurring $150 million in direct savings and close to $2 billion in indirect savings. So pretty impressive, and I know for certain because I work with Cynthia for quite a few years now and I'm always impressed with her acumen and ability and passion. But let's make this, let's also make this hour worth your time. Feel free to ask questions today uh, via the question feature or even the chat feature if you're so inclined. And if you have any questions about a specific situation at your workplace, feel free to email me, that's victor, at businessperformanceusa.org. That's, of course, our URL. And we're here to help. So knowing more about you, your situation, and your organization helps us understand how to provide a service that can help grow your organization. Of course, you can watch this webinar and all webinars on demand on our website. And all you really have to do is just sign up for a free membership, and within the member portal, you will have all of our content at your fingertips, including dozens of recorded webinars to help you grow your organization. And having said all that, I'm going to move over to Cynthia Stewart. Cynthia, I'll take it away with you. Well, thank you, Victor. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Uh, I always love to do these webinars and to share some tips and tricks that I've learned along my way. And uh, one thing I'd like to do real quickly is to make go ahead and give some acknowledgments. I have long been a reader and a studier of management, in particular in the arena of quality. And I a lot of, of what I've learned to Deming and Shuhart and uh, the Toyota production system and so forth and so on. There are many, many people I could cite. But this work that I'm doing now is heavily influenced by Dr. John Kanegi. Um, I picked up his book, Designed to Adapt, Leading Healthcare in Challenging Times, and thought, oh my goodness, this guy really gets it. And as I studied him and then reached out to him, I've now become um, uh, an associate. Essentially, I'm under working agreement with Dr. Kanegi. And uh, his work was influenced by Spear and Bowen, uh, decoding the DNA of the Toyota pr production system. So I just want to get that out there real quickly and say uh, that a lot of my work is now being influenced by Dr. Kanegi, and I've enjoyed my working with him. So now just to move on to the silver bullet. Yes, the silver bullet. 
Um, it must be interesting to you that I would title this Problem Solving is Your Silver Bullet, and I want to give a little context. What happened to me was that uh, this concept of silver bullet, I'll never forget this one evening, I'm at a reception. It was a reception for the team that I had been guiding and leading, um, which had been given this huge task. Okay, we were given this core process and told, fix it this core process. Now this core process served over 5 million customers. It was reliant on over 23 IT systems with millions of daily transactions. It affected absolutely every department in this one line of business that we were in that had over 5,000 employees. And we have just been told to fix it um, and we have been three months studying and come up with well, we stopped counting at 100 problems. What we found were so many problems that we just decided to quit at 100 and tackle those. And so we had just presented our primary solutions, and the vice president under which I worked came up to me and said, so, you guys didn't really find a silver bullet, did you? And I tried not to look aghast at him. <laughs> Clearly, he never considered the huge complexity and the lack of direction that the, the uh, executive team had given us. So I just looked at him and I smiled and I simply said, oh yes, we did, it's customer communication. And uh, so with that, I never forgot about that comment. You never really found the civil, silver bullet, did you? And what I'm finding, Victor, and um, to folks that I, I'm talking with today is that there's this mindset of the silver bullet. So I went out and I, I uh, Googled it and found Wikipedia, and there's an idi idiomatic use for silver bullet. But let me start with where it starts. Silver bullet was used, was required to, cure, to kill werewolves. So that's how far, far back it goes. Uh, you had to have a silver bullet. And it later became uh, a way to think about solving problems when Dr. Ehrlich came up with a magic solution, a uh, magic cure for a, an ailment condition that I don't remember anymore, but that's when it started to be used sort of in this context of some sort of straightforward solution perceived to have extreme effectiveness. And it was this, ex it's this expectation that some new technological development or practice will easily cure a major prevailing problem. So there you have it. There is the way we think today. The typical um, way that we think is that solutions are the silver bullet. So I want to talk to you now about, well, maybe there's two approaches to problem solving. So Victor, next slide. You see, there really are two approaches to problem solving, and the first and typical or conventional approach is what the silver bullet idea is all about, which is there's always some straightforward solution um, to have extreme effectiveness. And the typical approach to problem solving is viewed that way. We're, we're basically going after the solution. Um, the typical approach has been researched and documented in many studies. In fact, one that's cited uh, by Dr. Kanegi is why hospitals don't learn from failures, organizational and psychological dynamics that inhibit system change. That was done, they published their studies in 2003 in the California Management Review after quite a study of nurses in a typical hospital setting. And uh, the adaptive approach has been researched and applied successfully. In fact, you could say that Deming's work was based on the, uh, the um, adaptive approach. You could say that Toyota's is certainly the adaptive approach. Uh, you could say that Lean and Six Sigma, to some extent, are the adaptive approach. And certainly, Dr. Kanegi's book, Designed to Adapt, is the adaptive approach. So what are the differences between these two approaches? You know, basically, when you look at my little chart here, you see that when you think about silver bullet, the typical approach says that solution is your silver bullet, whereas the adaptive approach is thinking differently about it. They're saying the adaptive approach to problem solving is for the learning, not the solution. 
and uh, that sort of is counterintuitive. But they say that it's to develop critical learning skills, um, critical thinking skills, and to learn. The approach uh, for typical problem solving is what's called the first order approach. In the first order approach, people just they come up with the first solution they have, and they apply it, and they move on. And a lot of times in problems, as you know, it has to do with missing material or missing information or things like that. And so they just fill in the gaps with whatever they can find. In the second order scientific method, the second order of the scientific method, it's more of an experimental approach. The focus in, and we're going to talk about that, so I won't go into a lot of detail right now. The focus is really on the typical solve, let's solve the big problems at the process level. Small problems, you know, are, we're just going to move on and ignore those or work around those because we have bigger fish to fry. And so that's kind of the prevailing attitude. Uh, whereas in adaptive problem solving, the um, idea is that every problem should be solved. Every problem nearest to the work should be solved. Now the manager's role in the typical problem solving is they're the problem solvers. They have to gather data, and then they dictate these solutions. And in the adaptive approach, their role is simply to coach and teach problem solving. They want to help develop the critical thinking skills, to help develop this experimental approach to solving problems. And the interesting thing around the typical problem solving approach is that what we're trying to do is reach to the standard way to do the work. So standards become how to do the work, and they get mandated. And there's this simplistic notion that all you need to do is tell everybody the standard way to do the work, and that we always get the best outcomes that way. Um, and the adaptive approach, how we, uh, the standard is based on how we solve problems, not how we do the work, but rather when a problem occurs, how do we solve it? So in that example I mentioned earlier with my team, my team found so many problems I said that, you know, what we decided to do was just stop at 100. We could have literally spent years in multiple projects trying to get everything working smoothly, especially under this mindset of, you know, standardizing the work. Uh, we did have a substantial impact. Our customer satisfaction hit the top quartile, in fact, the top part of the top quartile after our work, so, and our costs did begin to decline, so I can't say that there were no gains. But we were swimming in this sea of problems, and people were so frustrated by it all, and they, they really kind of gave up on the idea that any of the problems were ever going to be solved. So um, managers in that scenario were required to, you know, make the decisions on the solutions that we put forward, and then we were to go and do set up new standards by which everyone was to work by. So I have direct experience with the problem solving approach, and the the realization is that you just continue to have more problems, and the standards create more problems, and the solutions create more problems. So. Um, as I begin to talk now about the problem solving, let's go to the, the next slide. Cynthia, I do have a, a question submitted from the audience, and, and thank you for that. The question is if uh, I'm inferring this is in regards to the focus column, focus category, and a, a cross-section with the adaptive, uh, working on every problem nearest to the work. So the question asks, if you're working on every problem, how will you have time to do the work? And I, yeah. I perhaps that question is in contrast that, that in your other method, in the typical method, you stopped at 100 problems, understanding that you could be working on problems all day long. So can you explain that, that uh, dichotomy, that, the, the confusion that exists at that level? Yes, and that's counterintuitive. I talk, I talk about, about this, this work, work being counterintuitive. And so, and so the answer, the answer is, is that when you when solve you problems nearest to the work, you actually reduce the scope, size, and scale of the problems that you encounter. So instead of them stacking on each other, and we're going to get more and more into this, instead of them just growing and growing and growing, 
uh, what you're doing is solve them as they occur, and you solve them once and for all. So it's counterintuitive that, gosh, if all we do is solve the problem, how to get the work done, what you're doing is you're eliminating the problems so they don't grow on themselves and cost you time in the future. In a minute, I'm going to go over some slides that are going to help make this a little more. A vis I have some visuals that will help with this, and it'll become a little more intuitive, Victor. All right, so um, in part two of this series, I talked about the four rules of engagement. In fact, in part one and part two, I talk about that you really need um, the right mindsets, methods, strategies, and structures. And I've gone over this model. This is Dr. Kanegi's model. He calls him 2S2. Um, and I've used a lot of different models to demonstrate culture, but I think this is really straightforward and simple. And so I'm going to talk about um, the fact that in order for this work, this adaptive problem solving, to be successful, you have to have an engagement culture. And what's interesting is this approach builds an engagement culture. And uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit more. And I've talked about that in my part one and part two as well. But um, there must be the right context for this work this problem solving, this approach to problem solving to work properly. So I'm going to go ahead and review this real quickly and not go into a lot of detail. I encourage you to go and pull my white papers and with, watch the webinars on this if you want to know more about this model. Great model. Um, but in, the, in this, uh, just a quick review, mindset, your mindset is that problems are opportunities to be solved. People are naturally adaptive problem solvers. <clears throat> if you don't believe that, um, then <laughs> I need you to start observing. When problems come up or issues come up, what happens is people immediately go to solutions. That's what they do. They jump to solutions. Um, the strategy is that if people are such great problem solvers and they like like to solve problems, let's really culture that. Let's grow that. Let's make sure they're doing problem solving in a way that's really effective. So let's teach all employees how to use the scientific method to solve problems, or otherwise uh, second order problem solving. Now the structure um, for this is that supervisors are, and leaders are there to teach and coach each person in second order problem solving rather than solving the problems themselves. So that's not the, that's not the conventional way or traditional way that we uh, use management now. The method is that employees identify problems when they arise. They engage whoever is affected by those problems, like say supply chain or the people down line from them, if they're handing information or uh, materials off to, and they identify and test solutions in real time under the guidance of a teacher. So those those are kind of, that's the structure, that's the way that you, you need to set up your culture. So next slide. In part two, I also talk about the four rules of engagement. These are very important aspects to building this engaged culture that is engaged in critical thinking, growing their critical thinking and their problem solving skills. So I talked about the four rules of engagement and I described those in my white paper for part two. They're based on the four rules and use described in Dr. Kennedy's book and also um, I've learned through his experiencing adaptive design online training and working in his method. Um, the four rules are basically activities Activities rep the, represent the work of an individual unaided. Connections, and those are the simplest of teams, um, basically customer supplier to people. Pathways are the, uh, multiple connections, multiple activities and connections uh, that deliver one product or service. And then improvement is how we improve the work through problem solving. And I uh, talked about these four aspects in my prior uh, webinars. So I won't go over them in great detail today, but only from the standpoint of, um, of problem solving. Just remember that the rules require that activities, connections, and pathways 
have built-in tests to signal problems automatically, and the continual response to problems makes the system flexible and adaptable to changing circumstances. The problem with traditional problem solving and standards is that there is this underlying assumption that um, the work that things don't change. There's as long as the in using the silver bullet, as long as we use an extreme, ex, as long as we implement the extremely effective solution, it can only be extremely effective as long as the conditions don't change. So adaptive problem solving recognizes that things change every day and that while you may have a sequence of steps and activities that you do, things can happen like um, people don't show up for work, uh, suppliers don't deliver on time, um, the customer has different needs and requirements, we have a different patient with a different set, uh, diagnostic setup. So the list of possible changes occur every day. And so that's why you're solving problems as you go, because the truth is we do that anyway. What we want now is to say, look, everything, can, everything changes all the time. And so what we need to do is get better and better and better at adapting to those continuous changes. And that's why adaptive problem solving is so successful and why Toyota uses it and many other organizations that are top of the heap now is they use this approach. So let's go on now to the next slide. Cynthia, just to talk about um, Cynthia, if I may, uh, just a quick note. We're having a, a comment yeah. from comment from our audience. It's a little hard to hear, so if there's something you can do on your end to increase the uh, volume, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Victor. I'll try to speak up better. Perfect. Okay. What I did is kind of put together the who, what, where, when, how, why of problem solving here. And what we see is basically a statement that, in effect, is rule four. Um, and that is essentially adaptive problem solving, or rule four, states that the worker, under guidance of a leader or teacher, solves each problem in the workflow using the scientific method when the problem occurs and does it in alignment with the organizational purpose. And so that's, that's basically the approach or how you think about problem solving, that rule four that I went over in the last few minutes and also in the last webinar. So let's move on and talk now a little more detail about the second order problem solving method, Victor. Okay. okay. So how this works is basically four steps to scientific method. Um, the first is you observe and describe the current condition, and you want to be specific. You know, um, we'll we'll talk in a minute about a pretty simple problem, but uh, you want to. What I find, and what I would have to do in leading my teams, is to get them to stop giving solutions until we had the problem fully defined. What you find is that if you really define the problem well, the solution falls out. You don't even have to think about it. If you understand the problem and the current condition under which that problem occurs and you define it well, then the, pro the uh, solution just falls out of that. So you describe the current condition and then you formulate, formulate possible causes. Um, you know, a lot of people use the five whys to formulate the causes. It's where you say, well, why did, um, why did the customer not know that their, oh, let's give an easy one. Why did the customer not know that their power was on? Well, they weren't home to test it. I see. So, you know, you have to ask why. Why weren't they home to test it? Well, because they're out working. Okay, well, um, did they get information that they needed where they were, despite the fact that they weren't home? In other words, what was done to make sure that they knew that their power was on? So it's that sort of questioning that really helps. Five whys is a good way to do it. And like I said, if you describe the problem well, um, you'll have the solutions just drop out. The next thing you do is you define the target condition. What is the target condition? What is it that 
we need to be achieving and that we're not. And then you experiment until you reach that target condition. Now this approach, this scientific method approach, I'm using here uh, the way it's described by Dr. Kennedy. Many people are familiar with this uh, plan, do, check, act cycle that Deming uh, made very popular. Um, he, he called it the Schuhart. Schuhart is the one that actually formulated plan, do, check, act. And there are many variations of PDCA or plan, do, check, act. Uh, plan, do, study, act is what Deming kind of went to in the end. Um, the to make for the, the define, measure, analyze, improve, and control is the Six Sigma approach to PDCA. So this is not new, by the way, this approach to scientific method. It's been around forever, <laughs> for a long, long time. Certainly, we've seen scientific method used by people who are considered scientists, and um, this really supports the, the scientific approach that Toyota uses there. F people are familiar with the A3 f report that Toyota uses. Same thing, defining the target, de defining the current condition, formulating possible causes, defining the target condition, and experimenting. Working with this, this simple little model um, help solve problems very quickly in answer to the question that came up earlier while teaching the worker about the work, helping them uh, develop critical thinking skills, new insights, and helping them gain uh, new information about the work itself. And that's why it works so well, and that's why it doesn't take longer. But I'm going to get into how long it might take to do this um, in, a, in a minute. But Given this experimentation, when it's encouraged, uh, failure is understood that as part of the learning process and it's freely allowed. So problem solving with this approach, it's highly engaging for workers. And using this rigorous and iterative method for problem solving basically in the end allows companies to continually innovate and stay ahead of the competition. Um, and that's how Toyota has continually evolved and stayed ahead. So, Victor, let's go to the next slide. All right. Now, typically what happens with this four-step approach is a lot of times people look at this problem-solving approach at the process level. So they say, I need to meet um, this particular target condition. So I need to make sure that um, the example that I'm going to be teeing up is at a doctor's office. All of us know what it's like to go to a doctor's office and wait. And I'll give you a hint, if I ever have to wait more than 45 minutes, I get up and leave and never go back to the doctor. But there will be people who will wait an hour. I've heard my mother say she waited two hours for a doctor. All of us have that experience of waiting for a doctor. So in the example I tee up, I'm talking about um, that being a problem, okay? And so we go through um, and say, you know, at the end of the day, how many people had to wait how long for a doctor? And was that acceptable or not? A lot of people get to the end of the day or the end of the process, and they see if the target was met. So maybe, you're, um, maybe your particular problem that you're trying to solve is driving to work in the morning. And you find that you use the same route, and you get to the particular you get to your work site and you're either 15 minutes off or you're 15 minutes early. If you haven't adjusted your path along the way, either you listen to the radio report to see if the path that you normally take um, is clear today, or you didn't turn when you discovered that there was a delay. If you haven't adjusted your path to getting to work along the way, then you get there late or you get there early, but you never get there at the same time, typically. Or at least that's the experience when there's uh, heavy traffic getting to and from work. So what we have to do in this example that I just gave, getting to work, typically what we do is we adjust immediately. Oh, okay, so I see this. there's a delay, I'm getting off the highway. I see there's a delay, I'm taking a different route. So Victor, go to the next slide. The problem is if we get to the end of the process or the end of the uh, set of activities that we're working on and we don't adjust to them, 
we have to go back to the beginning if we're going to test this, right? So this, the best approach to this is that you take each activity and you set the target condition for that activity. That you do this one, two, three, four step. At the end of this activity, I am supposed to be at this spot. So um, using our driving to work example, at the, at, at the first light, usually that takes me about five minutes to get to the light. And oh my gosh, I'm 10 minutes to that light. I better make, adjust my path. And so using that as an example where these four activities are, say, the four stoplights or the four intersections where you can test if you're going to be to work on time, we adjust. We need to go to a certain end of the activity and see if we've met our target condition. If we've not met it, typically we need to redo that or we need to adjust all the other activities in order to meet that target condition on time, getting to work on time, that target condition called getting to work on time. So what we need to do is we need to shorten um, our experimentation to an activity level. Instead of experimenting at the big process level, like we often did, we want to we test each step along the way. So let's go to the next slide, Victor. I didn't put this in the order that I, I thought I did. Um, How can I help? Okay. So the next slide on rule four is where we take those three rules that I teed up at the beginning and we, we check the different levels, the different rules as part of our improvement. First, we look at the activities. Was the content specified? Was it executed in, this, in the order that it was, or the sequence that it was supposed to? Was the timing at, at this step a good, was it right? Or did we encounter something like a problem that kept the timing from being correct? And did we get the outcome that we wanted? Um, did we get to that light that we, we thought we'd be at at that point in time? Or were we way off? So at the activity level, you check and see. Once, you've, once you know that the activity is correct, then you look at the next activity and so forth. And then we, when we know that the activities achieve the outcomes we expected in the target conditions, then we need to look at the connections. Now, connections are customer-supplier connections. And so when we get to the connection, we need to look at, remember, they're supposed to be highly specified, right? as to the customer and the supplier. Customer provides the specification to the supplier. I need this material at this time. I need this information at this time. Um, so uh, if it's a doctor that's performing surgery, I need this tool, this particular surgical instrument at this time. When I say this, you hand it to me. This is the tool I need. It's highly specified. So that's a customer-supplier connection. Or in a doctor's office, the doctor says, I don't want my patients to wait. And so the connection is with scheduling. Scheduling, I want you to schedule, you know, set my schedule up in this manner. So we're, highly, we're specifying those connections between the customer and the supplier as to who, what, when, and how. And we're being um, unambiguous in that specification. Now, once we know that the connections are correct, then we look at the total pathway for the particular service or the product. Was the path specified and was it stable, simple, and direct? And I know that many of you have seen a workflow flow diagram that looks like a spaghetti pile, a pile of spaghetti. Um, if you flow out your work path, you can see where things are not simple and direct. You can see where the path is specified, but you know it's not stable. And so um, what we want to do in pathways is make sure that the pathway is specified, stable, simple, and direct. And if we can say it is, then we can say, well, was every resource on the path there that was needed? So were all the materials, was, was the, was the um, surgical instrument that I needed on my cart as I specified it? 
uh, well, were, were there surgical instruments that were not needed on my cart, right? That's the next one, no resource on the path that's not needed. And the next one is connections follow rule two. So we've tested that. Um, in the rule four improvement, and rule four improvement is that little diagram at the bottom where we uh, are specifying the current condition, formulating the solutions, um, and specifying the target condition, and then we're testing to see if it was correct. And we can do this at the activity level, at the connections level, and then all the way to the pathway level. Once we go to pathway only when we know that activities and connections are sound. Okay, next slide, Victor. Uh, Cynthia, if I may, I'd like to add a little bit of color to this slide, or commentary, if you will. Uh, sorry for the sports analogy. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks. Uh, when I, I, this is one of my favorite slides that you've ever produced, and that's saying a lot because I, I love your work. When I look at this, I, my pet thing is departmental silos, and this is how I address silos. Now, you've given a lot of great examples and diverse examples from, the, from a surgical operation room to getting to work on time, and that shows the flexibility of your problem-solving uh, process here. Often a problem I run into is these department silos, and when I look at the very first one, the content who and path specified, uh, my silos that I, I run up against are typically marketing, sales, IT, and customer service. And a lot of people profess that, you know, people need to cross-train and, and work across silos to uh, fulfill the ideal customer experience or the ideal patient experience, if you will. And they don't know how to do it. It typically takes a lot of meetings. It takes a lot of time. And they don't know where to begin. But that very simple path that you specify is by itself a tool for breaking down silos and having more of a spontaneous problem-solving exercise rather than having time-consuming meetings and you know Pareto analysis and whatnot. It's very spontaneous. And it's how you can get people across, in my world, marketing, sales, IT, and customer service to really collaborate towards an end goal. So I would encourage the audience to look at this as a very powerful cultural development tool which builds collaboration and accountability and transparency. And that's just all I wanted to add. Yes, Victor. Um, one of the things that I haven't mentioned in this, in this webinar, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, and that is that um, there's one more piece to all to this puzzle of developing this culture of engagement and learning and improvement. And that is that you want to structure the work in such a way that people who have continuous handoffs, such as IT or um, your supply chain or um, the people downline who are, are uh, depending on the information that you're supplying, you want to make sure that really, to be honest with you, on a daily basis, they're in conversation together. And by them being on, in conversation together and working together as a multidisciplinary team, you are able to be sure that daily you're addressing the things that were not there and the problems in the problem. In the, uh, information that was lacking in the system that didn't work like it was supposed to, in the handoff that didn't take place at the time or with the right materials that was supposed to. So if you are collaborating, to be honest with you, on a daily basis to make sure that things are flowing smoothly, you gain a lot from that. And that helps to break those silos down that I'm very familiar with and that most people are. Thank you, Cynthia. So great example of connections. Connections typically are, you know, connections are handoffs, let's face it. And so um, we always want to make sure that everything's well specified in terms of timing, who, what, where, when, how, that that's all very well specified. Um, so the handoff is good. The handshake is good. It's more like a handshake than a handoff. Um, so 
I'm using that example. I'm kind of teeing, I'm going to tee up this example of um, the typical doctor's office. Now, the current condition, and by the way, this is directly out of work that I've done um, in observing a doctor's office and helping them sort through this. Um, the current condition was that, and I sat and observed, and patients waited 30 to 60 minutes. Um, the other thing that I found out is the doctor, in order to, I would watch him, he would come and take a patient's chart and put it on a stack, right, in his office. And so um, he would go see a patient, bring their paperwork and put it on a stack. And so later I asked him, when did he get the paperwork done for the patient? Do you know that he would work every night and every weekend to fill, in, fill out all the paperwork? And so um, those are the two problems that I highlight here, the current condition. Now the possible causes are obvious, patient scheduling and patient load. You know, on the one hand, maybe the way they're scheduling patients wasn't, wasn't really working well because um, one thing I noticed about this doctor is that some of his patients actually came in to get a um, shot because he would help them with migraines and he was using a particular um, medicine that would help their migraines subside. So he really only needed to check in with them and see how the migraines were going. So they might be in his office 10 minutes, you know, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, in and out. Then he would get these really complex cases and um, they, were, they were around this topic of convergence disorder. And um, those would take anywhere to, to up to an hour for him to diagnose, and they, they would, people would sit and wait, all these migraine sufferers would sit and wait on all these conversion disorder, and there were other things as well, muscular dystrophy, lots of uh, neural, he was a neurologist, so lots of neural disorders. But um, when I showed him the chart, and it was too funky for me to actually put it up, but it, you know, insights right away, when, when we diagnose that people are waiting 30 to 60 minutes, and when I showed him how long every patient had to wait across a two-hour period, you know, he got that. He never really thought about that because he's focused on the patient, not on their waiting time, right? He had never thought about that. And so um, it was immediate, obvious, immediately obvious to him that scheduling should be improved. So what was the target condition? He really liked the idea that a patient would never have to wait more than 10 minutes to see him. So that would be patient, that would be time in the waiting room and then time in the office itself. He also liked the idea that he could complete his paperwork between patients. So it improved his quality of life. It improved the patient's kind of attitude and satisfaction with their experience with the doctor. So the target condition was that they would wait about 10 minutes and that he would also have time to complete his paperwork. So um, the test was group patients by the procedure that they needed. New patients would be lumped in with those that needed more diagnostics. And um, to allow time in between each patient, he didn't need a lot of time. Really, in most cases, no more than five minutes but to allow time to do the, patient, the paperwork. So, Victor, let's go to the slide that shows that target. I think it's, go back, um, go back to one more, one more. If we were to test this at the process level, we would just go ahead and say, okay, we think that if we go ahead and schedule a day's worth of patients, let's just schedule the days, so just test it on, the day, on a day. So that would represent this approach. Victor, go to number nine, uh, slide nine, and there you go. Uh, if we test it, maybe let's just test it for an hour. Let's just lump four of the, let's lump um, maybe six, four to six patients that are the ones that only need a shot or a quick review, let's lump those into one hour. Let's try this. Let's see at the end of the hour if we got better at this. This solved two problems. One, they got to wait shorter times. Two, he got to do the paperwork in between. Did that work? So using this um, test at a very, you know, you test it at a very low level, that tells you 
uh, very quickly without disturbing your whole scheduling process and all the patients, it tells you within an hour if that worked. And if it did work, then let's try the next hour, right? Let's try an hour where we group patients that take longer. Let's see if that works. And so you try it little by little. You crank that. And that's what I mean in the work itself. You crank it slowly, test it. Did it work? Yes. Did it not work? No. Why? Why didn't it work? Why didn't it work to group the four patients? Well, you gain new insights why it worked or didn't work, right? So if it didn't work, you gain new insights in what a better way to schedule those patients are without disrupting a lot of your patients. You just affected those four to six for that one hour or the two for that next hour. So you try this slowly but surely until you get the right mix. So you try, let's lump together all the ones that are really short. Let's lump together the next hour. Or maybe one day you do just the ones that are really short and quick. And then the next day, it's all the diagnostic ones that take longer, that you have to spend more time diagnosing and working on the problems. Maybe that's the next day. But you test your way into the new way that will work better for the doctor and for the patient. So now we can roll forward. Uh, I think it's about a slide. Let's go to slide 10, 11, and now 12. OK. Um, so why is the adaptive approach better? What I find in the typical or the conventional approach is workers feel undervalued because they don't get to solve problems. They're very frustrated and they finally disengage because, you know, things don't improve. In the adaptive, well, let me go down the, I'll go down the columns. Um, the manager's focus is we got to manage people to grow our results. In other words, they focus on the results. We've got to manage the people, tell them how to do their work, tell them how to solve their problems so that we can get the results we're seeking. Um, and what you do with that, and based on the examples I've given you today, there's, there was significant embedded waste in the uh, big example I started the day out with, with this you know, core processes. I can't even tell you. Um, that's why they attributed millions to what uh, my teams worked on is because there was so much embedded waste, so many workarounds, so much not solving the customer problem, so much time spent on customer complaints by managers. I mean, the list goes on. And unfortunately, the process was very delayed. It fell short of our customer expectations. And that's typical, guys. That's very, very typical. The approach is that we have to move towards mass standardization in order to serve the customer. It doesn't work. So let's go over to the adaptive. Why is it better? First of all, because you're developing uh, the learning of your workers, because they're getting to solve the problems using the standard approach, the standard problem-solving approach, they are engaged in this discovery and learning and developing their critical learning skills. So basically, they become very innovative in this process. It's amazing, but they become very innovative. Because their critical thinking skills are so enhanced, they get very innovative. And so it's a very engaging way to work. And managers, my goodness, instead of having to solve all the problems and be pulled in 60,000 directions by all these you know, employees that they have, basically what they're pulled towards is growing their people growing knowledge, growing critical thinking skills, growing the ability to solve problems, the worker to solve problems. So they're, they become the coach. They get to watch people grow. There's nothing more rewarding than coaching and watching people grow. We all know that. The other thing is that there's significant cost reductions. And that's why, again, I'm attributed um, the, the dollars that are stated in my bio were attributed to me by the vice president I worked under for so long. Um, he kept track. He said, you helped save us over 100, almost $150 million with the work that you did because there were significant cost reductions. We didn't have to reduce the people. We just had to reduce all the wasted effort and wasted resources and wasted time that people were spending on solving, quote unquote, the big problems. The other thing is that when you use this, you begin to see exponential improvements. It's Like I say, it's counterintuitive, but your results are exponential on every measure. 
The other thing is that what happens is instead of this mass standardization, we got to make sure everybody's doing it the right way because if they don't, then we're going to have all these problems. Instead of that, you're moving towards mass customization, recognizing conditions in business change daily. There, are, there is no such thing as one customer with one solution. There is no one patient. There is no one um, solution to service interruption or to patient wellness or to patient health. There is no one solution. The only way to standardize is standardize the problem solving because everything changes every day and we need to give the customer the best. So that's why adaptive problem solving is better. Okay, Victor, any questions? And if not, we can move to the next slide. No questions at this time, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay. So I am re-describing the silver bullet here. I'm saying that the silver bullet to problem solving is the learning, the critical thinking that happens. And basically, you could say that if you're problem solving approach is adaptive, that you're getting the learning because you're using the silver bullet of adaptive problem solving. Um, the work environment and the role definitions, what I talked about with regard to M2S2, they must support learning as the end game and problem solving through an adaptive approach as the end game. The what we standardize is not the work guys. Don't try and standardize the work. Uh, give you another example, and in, in when I worked, what they tried to do was to say, okay, we're going to standardize the, um, the work approach, and so everybody has to work in this manner when we do this, you know, when we turn this wrench or install this in the electric company, install this electric pole or put up this wire. We have to do it the same way, but guess what? The facilities they're working on are never the same because they were built over 50 years, decades they were built. So they're never the same. Nothing is ever, nothing, change is constant. That's what you learn. Change is a constant. So what you have to do is, con is to develop your ability to be adaptable, to develop, develop your ability to adapt, to problem solve the moment with what the conditions are in the moment. And um, and I'm I'm being a little bit like I talked about in the what you can do is you adapt doing the, you do the work in a new way and see if it works better and then the next time in a new way and see if it works better you continually adapt you don't standardize how you do the work you standardize how you approach the work in a way that adapts to the conditions the work is done under so continuous improvement and continuous innovation are built on small incremental improvements by solving problems in real time as part of the work itself. And guess what, guys? Gains are exponential by every measure. So consider this approach and watch for my white paper that's being developed today. And you can pull it down and read more. And certainly, you can always contact me if you have more questions. Anything else, Victor, from the audience? No, Cynthia, the audience is good, and thank you for asking. I really appreciate your input here. If I can uh, provide a quick summary or my own unique perspective, I think the notion of a silver bullet as is commonly thought of in the popular vernacular is really almost non-existent. There is no silver bullet in terms of a one-size-fits-all solution. And that's what people sometimes want, the silver bullet for fixing problems, the silver bullet for losing weight, whatever we're challenged with. But your approach is fascinating because the silver bullet is not the solution, it's the process. And the process itself is universally adaptable to all of the diverse problems that come up in a business and in an organization. And through creating that learning culture, learning how to solve problems on the second order level of solutions is really the way to, uh, is really your silver bullet, in fact. Um, but it's identifying the silver bullet is a different, uh, different subject or different feature altogether. So I really appreciate your sharing that with us today. I would encourage everyone to uh, reach out when you're having 
reoccurring problems at your company or your organization, contact me and I will put you in touch with Cynthia and we will help guide you and give you insight as to how you can fix these problems uh, you know, over the long term. So thank you, Cynthia. In closing today, we want to remind you that this is the conclusion of the Problem Solvers series. It's a three-part three part, uh, series uh, from the impact of disengagement to the four rules of engagement to problem solving itself is your silver bullet. We also have three webinars coming up in the next three weeks. Basic truths about background screening and marketing ROI in the age of authenticity and cycles of good living. You can find these on businessperformanceusa.org. And lastly, just to close out, one of the best ways to really Take advantage of Business Performance USA and the content that we offer to our clients and freely to our members is to go to businessperformanceusa.org and sign up to become a member. Just look for the worker bee here, click there, and you'll land on a page and fill out some very basic information. And you will become a member and have complete access to all of our content. Now, I'm already logged in, so rather than getting the membership registration page, we'll be able to go straight to my uh, personal wall. And from here, much of this content is accessible to you from our blogs and, very importantly, to our videos on demand. From here, you can see numerous webinars that we have produced. You can watch them at your convenience, and then you can communicate to us and ask us questions on how to learn how to apply these processes and techniques to your organization. And in doing so, Cynthia, do you have any last words? Or shall we close out? Cynthia may be checked off at the time. No, I appreciate the summary that you gave us. And uh, remember, problem solving is your silver bullet. Well said. Thank you, Cynthia. That's it. We're concluding for today. And again, uh, thank you for attending. And come back to businessperformanceusa.org anytime. We're here for you. Thank you.